invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Actually, this morning we'll just be looking at a portion of a verse. And so, just the first part of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 will be our focus of attention this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Peter writes, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that we can stand firmly upon every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless us today as we gather around your word. I pray that you would speak to us because we claim the affirmation that where the Bible speaks, God speaks. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. I pray that I would not get in the way of you speaking to your people today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross. Forgive me for my weakness and frailty. My stammering and stuttering would not be a distraction, but instead we might focus upon your word for us today as the body of Christ. And it would build us up and strengthen us to follow Christ's leadership. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. I heard about the guy who, the young guy who, like many teenagers, was complaining about his parents. He was tired. He was telling his friend, his buddy, he was tired of his parents telling him what to do all the time. He said, I don't want people, my parents telling me what to do all the time. They're telling me what time to get up in the morning, what time to go to bed at night, what clothes I'm supposed to wear, how I'm supposed, they even nagging me on how to cut my hair telling me I can't go here and I can't go there, I need to go here, I need to go there. I'm tired of it. I can't wait till the day where I just get out on my own and don't have anybody telling me what to do. And his buddy said, well, what are you going to do when you leave home? He said, I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to join the army. Some of y'all who've been in the military will understand. If you don't want somebody telling you what to do, the army may not be the place for you. If you have to explain a joke, it's not funny anymore. But uh, speaking of the military, by the way, just a side note, happy Veterans Day. And for those of you who have served our country, we do thank you so much for your service. But I was thinking about that this week because of the text of Scripture that we have before us speaking to the younger generation. It's almost a cliche, and really somebody, some people might say it's redundant to speak of rebellious young people, right? It kind of just goes hand in hand. And then when you add American in there, Americans, we don't like people telling us what to do, right? And so when I read this passage of Scripture that uses the word submit. No matter what the other two words are in the sentence, there is some bristling. I understand that. And there is even part of me, I understand it, there's almost part of me that wants to spend half the sermon saying, yeah, but what about this? And we know that we live in a time and a place where many authorities are usurping their power and getting out of their lane and taking authority upon themselves that really does not belong to them. And we can beat that drum loudly. But if I did so, I think I'd be taken away from what God's Word says. And may that never be. And so that's why I need to preface this sermon by making sure that we understand this is the holy word of God that we have for us. And our desire is to rightly divide the word of truth. Are we on the same page there? If so, let's dive into this half a verse, like I said. Peter just gives it a brief mention 
And so it was tempting for me just to give it a brief mention as, as well and go on to the next subject at hand, which would be humility. But this is part of God's Word, and I think that it's important for us to understand what God's Word is telling us. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so let's pick this half a verse apart. We will look at a couple other passages before we're done. Let me, let me just pick these few ver- words apart and maybe make it as simple as I possibly can to see if we can gain some insight into it and some help for us. leadership. Make it as simple as possible. Uh, let me mention that there's actually several words here in English, but it's really only four words in Greek. You know, I know when I mention the Greek original language that Peter was writing in, some think that I'm, I'm elevating the conversation. But trust me, I'm mentioning that only because it makes it simpler, I think, and easier to pick apart. There's actually only four words. Let me give you those four words, and then we'll come back and look at each one of them. The word, the first word is likewise. You see it translated here in the text, likewise. The next word is younger. It's a substantive, and so it's younger people or younger men. It is in the, the, uh, the masculine there, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's best translated in a moment, but it's simply the word younger. And then there's the verb to submit or to be under subjection, to put yourself under the authority of someone else, and so there's the verb there. And then the final word in this little uh, phrase here, this sentence here, is the word elder. And so, likewise, the younger submit to the elders. And so that's the four words there. So let's look at each one of those individual. Let's start with that last word, the elders, the elders. Now this is interesting, and I, and I almost hesitate to, to, to take this approach in my explanation because I don't want somebody to think that I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit or anything like that because I think there's something uh, very helpful on two different levels here. One is so that we can... I can help you understand the Bible for yourself, that you can read it more profitably for yourself, and then also to understand this particular passage. And, and so I hope I don't add confusion to this. But it's interesting if, and I'll, I'll do it this way. I know many of you have study Bibles, good study Bibles. Uh, I know many of you, actually the two that I have recommended over the years, and I think uh, many of you have one of these two study Bibles. One is the Reformation Study Bible. If you don't know what a study Bible is, it's just the Bible with extra footnotes and everything to explain and helps along the way. And one of them is the Reformation Study Bible. I know many of you have the Reformation study Bible. It's put out by Ligonier, R.C. Sproul, a great, great resource, a study Bible. If you don't have one, I would highly uh, recommend it. The other one is the MacArthur Study Bible, uh, of course, uh, put out by John MacArthur, which is also an excellent study Bible, uh, very good, and I know many of y'all have that one as well. Those are the two that I often recommend, one of those two. And most of the time, they are pretty much in agreement. It's pretty much pretty very similar because they both come at the Scripture with the same philosophy of the Scripture, that the Bible is the Word of God, that is inerrant, that is authoritative, it is sufficient. Both have a very high view of Scripture. Both come at it from, a, from, uh, from the same view of Scripture, very conservative, evangelical, theological persuasion, both love and embrace the doctrines of grace, and so most of the time they are on the same page. There's a few little differences here and there, especially because of John MacArthur's dispensationalism, but we kind of give him a pass because of that, and, and uh, check what, uh, what R.C. Sproul says on some of those few little issues, but then R.C. Sproul is a Presbyterian, and so we as Baptists kind of differ a few little places like that, but all in all, both both of those study Bibles are very, very good. So don't let anything that I'm about say, sound like I'm saying anything otherwise. But every once in a while, there is a difference between those two. It's a, in this case, it's a minor difference, it, it, and, and I'm, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on it because I'm going to, uh, hopefully you'll learn something uh, today. But it is somewhat of a uh, relatively insignificant issue. But let me see if I can explain it. Who are these elders that Peter is talking about here? 
Because that's actually, if I, you know, what a roadmap for the rest of the sermon. It's just those three words there. Uh, what, who are these youngers? And who are these elders? And what does it mean to submit? Those are the three questions based on those three words. And so the first one, elders. Who are these elders? R.C. Sproul says that they are... Well, let me, let me, let me give you the... the um, well, I'll go ahead and say, he, he, he says that these elders are just older people, older people in the congregation. Uh, and so it should be translated as just older people, or even just the elders as not the office of elder, but just older people. And then John MacArthur says that they are actually the elders of the church, the pastors of the church, the official office of elders. So you see the slight difference there in those two. I believe John MacArthur is correct on this and that Peter is, in fact, speaking of the elders of the church. Now, in speaking of those differences, and by the way, I, I won't list, there's, uh, I, I, I consult a dozen or so commentaries and other resources during uh, the week in preparation, and it was sort of split. And some were saying one and some were saying the other. I'm just using those study Bibles because I know many of y'all have them in your lap right before you. And so... In doing so, uh, let, me, let me sort of explain why R.C. Sproul, for example, or his guys that put together the uh, uh, Reformation Study Bible, would make a, uh, uh, the uh, assumption or the statement, it's not an assumption, I think it's an educated um, assessment, that this word elders is referring to um, just older people. And here, here's, here's why they do that. Because there's a rule of interpretation that I believe is extremely important. And this is what I was saying, trying to help you understand the Bible and read the Bible for yourself. One of the most important rules of interpretation of Scripture is to consider the context. To consider the context. A lot of people will find a, uh, a, um, a Bible dictionary, a Strong's Concordance. Now it's all, all online and you can just click on a word and it'll give you the, uh, a list of Greek definitions of, of this particular word. And unfortunately, while that is extremely helpful in some ways, it also leads some people just to click on the word, look at a bunch of definitions, and pick the one that they like the best. That's not a good way to interpret Scripture, okay? Uh, you want to take the context into consideration. What is, what is Peter talking about uh, surrounding it? And so, if you look at the, the immediate context, even in these four words, you'll look at the word younger there. And so, like I said, there's the word likewise, younger, submit to the, uh, to the elders. And so you have youngers and you have elders. Those are two age categories, right? And if you look at the word youngers that we'll get to in a moment, that is not an official office in the church, right? There's nobody, there's not a, a title of youngers. And so they say, well, in that immediate context, if there's no official office, he's not talking about the official office of youngers, therefore he must not be talking about the official office of elders. And so he's just talking about older people and younger people within the church, now that does make sense, and I, and I think that there is a lot of merit to that argument. Also, you can also see elsewhere in Scripture, however, I'll, I'll just I'll go ahead and say it like this, is however, I don't think that's what Peter is saying in this verse. In this verse. It's what the Bible says elsewhere. And so, you understand what I'm saying? There's, sometimes there's a truth that is true because the Bible teaches it, but that particular verse is not saying that. I hope I didn't lose y'all on that. Do did did you understand what I'm saying? Peter's not refer, referring to that, but elsewhere in the Scripture it does. And that's why I wanted to make sure that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Because we do see, if we take all of Scripture, there's numerous places where the Bible does admonish younger people to respect those who are older, those who have some mileage on them already, those who have had experience and gone through life. We ought to learn from them and respect them and be educated by them and follow their example and follow their lead. Uh, I mean, you can see that over and over and over, especially in the book of Proverbs, but elsewhere in Scripture. So that is a very, very important truth. However, I don't think that's what Peter is getting at here. I think Peter is getting at, is mentioning this particular reason, and he's speaking of the elders 
of the church. The reason I believe that is also because of context. This context here, if you look back at the four verses preceding it that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks, you see up in verse 1, Peter has already used this same exact word earlier in reference to, very clearly, unambiguously, he is talking about the pastors when he turns to the elders and he says, Elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. He's speaking to the elders there, the pastors, the overseers. And we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was three different titles for a pastor. A pastor, an a, uh, elder, and an overseer. The overseer, the word overseer, speaking to the spiritual authority. A uh, elder speaking to spiritual maturity. A shepherd or a pastor speaking to the spiritual responsibility. And so here in verse 5, he goes from speaking to the pastors, speaking to the elders, speaking to the overseers, and then says to young men, I want you to submit to that kind of leadership. You, you see? And, that, and see, that, that's what he's, what he's talking about here. Uh, and, and just to be clear, just to, to kind of repeat what I said last week, if we, if we look at verse 1 through uh, 4, as Peter is talking to the shepherds, talking to the pastors, talking to the overseers, Look, you have a responsibility. You have a duty. And here is your duty, to shepherd the flock of God. And do so without compulsion, but willingly. Not because you're forced, but because you are willing. It says, not out of shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over the flock, but being an example. And so we looked at those three pairs of don't do it this way, do it that way last week. And then he turns to the younger man and says, follow leadership like that. Follow the leadership that is not being compelled to do it, but is desirous and willing to serve the Lord in that way. Follow the ones that are not in it for shameful gain, for doing it eagerly. Follow those leaders that are not striving to domineer over the flock of God, but are setting a right and proper example for the flock. Those are the kind of leaders that you are to follow. You see how it just flows in what Peter is actually saying here. It's also helpful in the immediate context to make sure that we don't just skip over that word likewise. That word likewise Peter has already used this word several times in conjunction with that word submit. Those two words, out of the four words, two of those words we've seen already in the letter to the, to, uh, from Peter several times already in this letter. Uh, now it's been several months since we have looked at it, uh, but it's just a few verses up. We just, that's just part of going through the text so slowly as we do. That's why I'm, let me remind you every so often to read through 1 Peter on your own, uh, because I don't want you to forget what just the last chapter was. It was just a few verses up because we did it, looked at it months ago. And so every so often you ought to sit down uh, during the week and just read through uh, 1 Peter. You can read through it from beginning to end. It won't take you very long, depending on how long you read. It'll take you less time than to watching a rerun of Friends or Seinfeld or The Big Bang Theory or whatever uh, you might be watching. You can read through First Peter uh, faster than you can watch one of those reruns. And so do that, and when you do, you'll see a pattern here that Peter is laying forth. In the midst of suffering and difficulty, he says, look, there is an order that God has placed in the universe, that God has placed that we ought to follow. Remember, he talks to uh, citizens of whatever country you might be a part of. He talks to citizens and he says, you must submit to the civil magistrates, to your leaders, to the governmental authorities. Right? That's, that's what he says. And then the next thing he says, he says, and likewise, same word, wives submit, same word, to your husbands. And then he turns to the slaves and he says, servants, likewise, servants, Submit to your masters. And now he says, young men, submit to your elders. 
So you, so you see what, what Peter is doing here. He's saying, look, there's an order of authority. There's an order of submission in the larger society that we live in. There's an order of submission and, and authority within the home. There's an order of submission with, between slaves and masters. Today, we would say employee, employers. And so in the business world and also in the church. So you see what Peter is doing there. He's talking about spheres of authority in the different ways that we interact with each other in various spheres of our lives. And so I think that Peter is definitely here speaking to the context of the local church and these elders that are supposed to be setting themselves up as examples, preaching the Word of God as they follow Christ, following the leadership of Christ, and leading the flock in the way that they are to go. And so now that we looked at the word elders and answered that question, now let's look at the word youngers, the, word, the youngers, or as the ESV, what is the ESV? Likewise, you who are younger. Some of your translations, depending on what translation you might have, it actually says young men. And so then the question then arises again, who exactly is he talking to? Is he talking to only young men, or is he talking to just younger people in general within the church? Or I guess the third option would be that it was an official, um, uh, group within the church called the Youngers. Um, I don't think that that is the case, even though one of the church fathers did argue the fact that what, he, what, what uh, Peter is doing here, and in the early church, that there was uh, basically, this was a technical term for anybody that was not an elder. Because remember, the word elder does not mean that you are chronologically old, you're just spiritually mature and in that place of authority within the local church. And so the argument was that the word youngers could just mean and everybody else within the congregation, no matter how old they are. And that is plausible. I see that that could be the case. However, I don't think that we can uh, substantiate that because it doesn't seem like that word is ever used anywhere else in Scripture unless I can be proven wrong. I didn't really investigate it fully and look at every time this word is used. But I don't think that that's probably the case. I think what he's doing here... Oh, and then, so that's, that's the first one option. The second option would be young men in particular. And those that translate it as young men in particular do so probably because of two reasons. One is, without getting into too technical, it's an adjective that is in the masculine form in Greek. That's just how it works. Uh, and so they want to say, okay, well, it's a masculine younger, therefore young men. However, the, the way that the language, gender within language works, that doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, it, it could just mean, it, I mean, it has to be something. And so... Um, that may not mean what uh, people will push it to mean. And so I don't think that that's the reason why they would put young men there. However, we do see elsewhere in Scripture, and we're going to look at a couple of these places before we're done, but especially that young men are often singled out um, as special cases within the church for special attention within the congregation. And if you think about it, that just makes sense because where young, young men are in a place in their life where they're at a sort of a pivotal point in their life where if they go, start going the wrong direction, it's much harder to change directions later in life, right? Or as we like to say, can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, actually, God can change an old dog into a whole new dog, but that's on a, a whole different uh, level. But we do understand that it is very important time period in a person's life, especially a young man's life, when he is young and he is uh, coming into his own and he's making decisions for himself and he's setting a course in life. And so we in the church... Peter understands this. The Apostle Paul understands this. The author of the book of Proverbs understood this. Several other authors understood this because I believe it is the heart of God to take special care and attention to young men. A couple of y'all might have seen my YouTube video this week there where I uh, reviewed a little book by J.C. Ryle written well over a hundred years ago simply entitled Thoughts for Young Men. 
Extremely powerful book. Highly recommend it. We used to have some copies on the literature table. I I checked (coughs) this morning and they're all gone. We'll have to order some more from our good friends at the Chapel Library. But you can go to their website and just download it for free in whatever electronic ebook format if you use that type of thing. But we'll get some more copies here um, eventually which is a great resource. And in this book, J.C. Ryle turns to young men and explains how important it is for them to be following Christ at this juncture in their life. And that is so very true. And if I could just open my heart to you this morning, that has really been something that God has been speaking to me this week uh, through His Word, to be more faithful in praying for God to raise up young men in our congregation, to influence the young men of our community. And I I could give so many examples of how it can go terribly wrong uh, in a young man's life. I won't do so this morning because it would be inappropriate for me to do so publicly, if you know what I mean. But Join me in praying for the young men of this community. Pray, uh, join me in praying for the young men in this church, that we would be good examples to them and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you've, excuse me from using the terminology being a cheerleader, uh, cheering them on, encouraging them on for the cause of the gospel. I think that's extremely, extraordinarily important. However, at the same time, let me go ahead and mention the fact that I believe that when Peter here is referring to the younger, he's not exclusively talking about young men. He's talking about anyone who is younger. And it might be interesting for you to see that it it seems like in Scripture the term younger is, is, is used oftentimes, or excuse me, the word older and not in the technical sense, but the word older is oftentimes not used until you're 60 years old. <laughs> and, so, and so younger, so any of us under 60, uh, you're, you're not old yet. Uh, so that ought to be an encouragement, right, Jenny? Uh, so you're not old yet. You're still very, we're all still very young. Uh, and so this is really for all of us, for all of us. I say all that with uh, sort of uh, my tongue in my cheek just a little bit, but I think you get the idea. We should not hear uh, what the Apostle Peter is saying to the young men and say, oh, that's just for them. Because all the warnings that the Bible gives to young men, I don't know, stick with you at least till you're 53 years old, I can tell you that for sure. And so let us hear these admonitions, not for somebody else, but for ourselves. And so we hear this. This morning, I promise you, I'd look at a couple of other passages, and let me so let me do that so uh, quickly uh, this morning. Turn with me to Titus chapter two, verse six. Titus chapter two, verse six. This is one of those places where I say that, uh, and I, I'm going to point this out simply because I wanted you to make sure that I'm not making this up. That oftentimes in Scripture, uh, when when The biblical writer is talking to different groups in the church. Oftentimes, they set aside young men explicitly. And in Titus chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks first to the older men and tells them their responsibilities. Then he speaks to the older women and tells them their responsibilities. To especially to train up the younger women, and so speaks to some of their responsibilities. And then later after this verse, he speaks to slaves and masters and all the rest. But in Titus chapter 2, verse 6, he simply says, Likewise, urge the younger men, and there we do have the word men explicitly stated there, the younger men to be self-controlled. That's the only thing. He gives all these, intri- all these other things for all these other people. He says, look, just tell the man just to be self-controlled. I, I, I guess it, he's figuring if we can do that, that's a good place to start. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, he, he needs to start with just being self-controlled. Uh, stop flying off the handle and doing things uh, you know, on whims and, and, just, and just taking off in all different directions. Just work on self-discipline. Uh, let, let's start with that uh, for the young men. But then later on in that same chapter, if you look down to verse 15, and this is the dovetail in with saying this is really for all of us, for all of us. If you look at verse 15, 
He then turns to pretty much everyone after going through all these different demographics within the church. He says that declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. There's that pastoral authority again. And the authority is limited to these types of things. He says, letting no one uh, dis- letting no one disregard you, remind them, and then he gives you it gives seven areas that that uh, Timothy is to remind his flock of specifically. And we won't go take any time to look at each one of those. Let me just read them. But there's seven of them. He says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Apparently that's a big issue uh, that the Bible wants us to understand. Number two, he says, to be obedient. Number three, to be ready for every good work. Number four, he says, to speak evil of no one. (coughs) Number five, he says, to avoid quarreling. Number six, to be gentle. And number seven, to to show uh, perfect courtesy toward all people. And so there's a long list there that we are to obey, especially the young people. But he says this really to everyone. Now speaking of that, let me show you one more passage over in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. And this is a very interesting verse in the context of everything that we're saying this morning. And let me, let me show you why. Because Timothy, remember this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. Who is Timothy? He is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And so, so this is why it's interesting. He is both a young person, relatively speaking, and an elder at the same time. He's, he's younger and an elder at the same time, if, if you see what I'm saying. And he explicitly says that in verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Look what it says. He says, Let no one despise you for your youth. And so in other words, look, I know there's people in the congregation that you are older than they are. You're their elder because you're the pastor. That's your technical office. You are an, their elder, yet they're chronologically older than you are. And so don't let anyone despise that. Don't let anyone say, well, who are you to say these things to me? No, you are the authority. You are to speak the Word of God. You're not to allow anyone to intimidate you and to stifle your words and to, to, to lock up your tongue just because you are chronologically younger than they are. He says, let no one despise you for your youth. And so he was a relatively young man. We don't know exactly how old he was, but that's what the Scripture tells us. He says, but instead, instead of letting them despise you, he says, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Set an example. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's exactly what Peter said over in 1 Peter chapter 5 in the first four verses. He tells the shepherds, he tells the elders, he tells the overseers, you should set an example for the church to follow. Set an example especially for the younger generation to follow. And then we see the Apostle Paul telling Timothy who is part of that younger generation, but also the example. Here's how you're to live. If you're doing the math there, that means all of us are to be living this way. Let me just briefly go through these five. I won't take the, uh, much time with them, but I want you to see that when Peter, I mean, when Paul gives this instruction to Timothy, he's covering basically all of his bases. He doesn't say very specific things. Instead, he gives five big categories. He says, number one, sir, set an example for them in speech. In speech. In the words that you say. The way that you say things. And if you think about it for a minute, that covers so many different things. For one, of course, it would prohibit blasphemy. You know, breaking the third commandment. Taking the Lord's name in vain. Of course, we need to set an example for that. For that. 
Also, not to use vulgarity and, 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 and speech like that, or, or, or as the Apostle Paul calls it el elsewhere, um, uh, crude jesting. We should avoid that kind of thing. In other words, the jokes that we tell. The jokes that we tell. We ought to guard our speech. And not only in those types of ways, but also in just the way that we talk to people. Whether we're showing respect or not showing respect. In our truthfulness, there's the ninth commandment as well, that we ought to guard our speech, that we ought to show an example in our speech, that our speech is honest and all the rest. And also that we ought to not offend people unnecessarily. I was thinking about this and, and knowing that uh, those... Those of us uh, in this room are, you know, in our generation, the 21st century, conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, we kind of have a low tolerance for those who are easily offended in our generation today, right? And I can preach a thousand sermons on that, and I'm tempted to do so. I have, I have to admit, and, and I'm probably the most sympathetic person in the room. And I'm not bragging, I just, I just got it how God's wired me. And even I have a very low tolerance for these snowflakes that are complaining about everything and being offended about everything. If you don't know what a snowflake is, I used that terminology one time, Brian, and somebody said, what is a snowflake? Uh, you know, it's a generation that's being raised up saying, oh, you're unique and you're special and there's nobody like you and if anybody says otherwise they start to melt and they need a safe space and they're triggered and they don't know what to do. It's that kind of mentality. You've seen it. Some of y'all are laughing. You've seen it. I have a pretty low tolerance for that type of thing. However this morning let me jump on the other side of the fence and make sure that we understand. Uh, well one is don't be like that. Okay. Hear me say that very loudly. But let me jump on the other side of the fence is we as believers should not be intentionally offending people with the way that we talk. Jesus had some bold things to say, but people were offended not in the way that he said it, but in the content of what he said. When he held their lives up to the righteousness of God. It wasn't because he was being ugly. It wasn't being, because he was being calloused. It wasn't because he was being careless that he offended people. And so we ought to set an example for others in our speech. We should think before we speak. That's what I remember one of my pastors growing up said, that's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. He wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. So we need to set an example for others in our speech. Number two, he says, in our conduct. In our conduct. Our speech, by the way, would include gossiping and all sorts of other things. In our conduct, that's the way that we live our lives. And just how we interact with other people. I don't think that he's primarily here in this word talking about our moral conduct. He covers that in the last word, purity. And so if there's a distinction there between just our conduct being an example in our conduct and being an example in our purity, I think he's focusing on our outward behavior. But not only our just moral outward behavior, but just in the way that we carry ourselves. In the way that we plan our days. Because sometimes there's things that we can do that are not necessarily sinful, but they're just bad examples for others. We ought to be considerate of that. And we ought to set an example for others and be self-disciplined and all the rest. The third thing that he says in love, there were to be examples for the younger generation examples in love. Now every time I talk about love, I have to, I have to make sure that we don't uh, bring in the worldly kind of love that is so prevalently talked about uh, today. And that even in, in our English language, the word love can be used in so many different ways. It kind of gets uh, confusing. But biblical love is not the, not the same as worldly love. See, worldly love loves something because of what it can do for you. Biblical love is what you can do for someone else. And the attitude that goes along with that. The action that goes along with that. If you miss what I'm saying there is if you love ice cream, for example. Why do you love ice cream? Because you want to help ice cream out? No, because you love ice cream because what it can do for you. When you put it in your mouth, you taste it, it tastes good, you like it, it's doing something for you, you see. 
And, and uh, so, so many people can't get past, that's the only kind of love they know. And they love some people because of that. Only because of what that person can do for them. You, you, you know what I'm saying? In so many different levels. But that's not what biblical love is. Biblical love doesn't say, what can you do for me? Biblical love says, what can I do for you? Of giving of yourself. That's why, like, for example, you know, if you think of love, the one uh, uh, chapter in Scripture you ought to, your mind ought to immediately go to is 1 Corinthians 13, right? Are you familiar with 1 Corinthians 13? You don't have to turn to it now, but 1 Corinthians 13 is often referred to as the love chapter. I love the way that the King James Bible translates that word love. If you look up 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in the King James, it doesn't even use the word love. Love is nowhere in there. It uses the word charity. Translates it as the word charity. Because that's really the biblical understanding of the word love is to do for others. And so when Peter is here, you, I mean, uh, the Apostle Paul is here saying that we're to be an example in love, he's talking about as being an example of your service to others, really. Not the warm, fuzzy feeling you might have in your heart for someone. Not that that's a bad thing necessarily. But how are you serving others? How are you pouring yourself out? How are you not caring about what others can do for you, but instead caring primarily what you can do for others? That's being an example in love. He says, fourth, to be an example in faith. An example in faith. And I believe when he uses the word faith here, he's not speaking of faith here in a religious sense, like having faith in Christ. He might be using it that terminology. But I think he's more uh, speaking of faithfulness, being faithful, being, being consistent, being steadfast, being, being uh, loyal and being able to be relied upon. That is uh, what he is referring to here, being an example in that, being consistent in your life. And then finally he says, be an example in purity. In purity, and here he is speaking of moral purity. Sometimes when we think of what the Bible says about moral purity, our mind immediately goes to things of sexual purity, which and that's part of it, but I think it's even more than that. It's being pure in every way, being morally unspotted, sexually, emotionally, uh, according to God's holy standards. He's really speaking here of holiness, that inner holiness that nobody else can really see. It does bleed out into the outside, but it doesn't start on the outside. It starts on the inside when God transforms your heart. And so he has that last in the list. I don't think because it's the least important, it could be argued because it is the most important. The speech, the first one, that's the external thing. That's the part that everybody hears. That's, the, that's just the surface. And then it gets deeper and deeper and deeper into your heart. It goes all the way to the purity of your heart. And we ought to be an example, especially here in this context, to the younger generation. And not just the pastors, but all of us. All of us. Because if the Lord tarries, there will always be a younger generation coming up underneath us. And so setting that authority and that hierarchy in place and understanding the way that God has designed the universe is helpful for us. And I understand completely that we live in a society, and I mentioned this as in the introduction, that we live in a society that is very anti-authoritarian. Hierarchies are seen to be old-fashioned and out of date but they come from God's Word, and they're timeless. So we think of our interaction in society, in our families, in the business world, and in the church, in the larger kingdom of God. Remember, we serve a king. Now that doesn't compute in our modern American vocabulary, does it? We don't understand what it really means to have a king. But we as Christians ought to because we aim to serve our king well. He is the supreme authority. He is the supreme example. He is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd for us all to follow his example. Let us then in turn be examples to others. Let's pray.
Dear Lord God, I do thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word. And I pray that we might be faithful examples to others as we follow our King. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing a hymn of response.